So um, who here has absolutely no idea what I'm going to talk about and has never heard of the uh, E1 software defined interface before? You know it exists, okay. <laughs> it, does, it doesn't actually yet, but uh, <laughs> that's, that's the whole point. <laughs> right. Um, so there was a, a previous talk uh, um, at uh, Osmo Con in 2018 where I presented uh, kind of the state of things. Um, and here I'm going to try to focus on uh, what I've been working on, and uh, which is the, um, like, um, the implementation that, that uses an ICE 40 FPGA as a basis for the implementation of, of this. Um, so because I just did the uh, ICE 40 before, I'm gonna just start with the hardware. So that's the first prototype. Uh, I'm not really sure if I, sh I showed it in before, but uh, that was based on an Arduino board, um, which is a UP5K development board, which has horrible, horrible layout, and is pretty much non-functional until you beef up the ground connection so that there isn't ground bounce around and, and you add decoupling capacitors and that kind of stuff. That's just to get it working. Uh, and then that's uh, the mess of wires with my different attempts at, uh, at doing an E1 Phi. Um, I made a new board, uh, which is this one. Um, and it's meant to plug into the icebreaker uh, that I uh, mentioned before. So it has a dual P-mod connector. Um, and this, in, this includes, this, that's the clock part. Um, so it's a 30.72 megahertz clock because that's pretty much the only clock. If you divide it by 15, you get 2.048 for E1. And uh, I don't remember the exact ratio, but you can actually multiply it uh, with the ICE 40 PLL uh, into 48 megahertz for USB. And so you have a, a both clock from uh, one crystal. Um, that's the USB interface. It's really just direct connection to the FPGA pins. You just have like the series resistor for, uh, I'm not sure why, but yeah, impedance matching, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say. Um, and that's the E1 um, Phi that uses only FPGA IOs. Um, that's the way it works. So uh, I'm still using, a, obviously, a transformer. I tried doing without the transformer, but using only capacitive coupling, couldn't make it work. Like I can make either TX or RX work, but when you have both, you have too much common mode, common mode noise uh, leaking from one to the other, and that doesn't work. So, okay, I, I actually have to use a, a transformer. Technically, I only need the transformer on one of the two sides, either RX or TX, but it doesn't make sense because they don't sell half a transformer, so they're just... <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, so the transmit side is very simple. It's basically two resistors, and you just uh, send the pulse on one or the other. Uh, so you're going to have zero, um, uh, three volts uh, divided by the impedance or whatever. And so if you use a one... Sorry? Right, yeah. So the, the physical layer link of... Uh, um, on E1 is you get positive pulse or negative pulse when it's a one, and you have no pulse when it's a zero. That's the kind of levels that you would find of the line. Uh, so you get a positive voltage, a negative voltage, or nothing. Um, and then you have a bunch of encoding to transform your bits into those pulse um, so that you don't get too many runs of zeros because you would lose low synchronization. And so there is bit stuffing, uh, no, sorry. The no, it's not bit stuffing, it's uh, something else, uh, whatever. <laughs> you, you, it's called HDB3 encoding, uh, and so you get positive, negative pulses, and that's, what, that's basically what you need to detect. Either a positive pulse, a negative pulse, or no pulse. Um, that's kind of a uh, trinary encoding. Uh, and so here, if you toggle that I.O. and not this I.O., you get a positive pulse. If you do the opposite, you get a negative, to negative pulse. And if you don't do anything, well, you don't get many pulls. Um, and so, yeah, takes is very easy. Um, detecting uh, on the Eric side is much more complicated. Um, this takes more components. Um, that's just the termination resistor. Like the nominal impedance of the line is 120 ohms. So you put a 120 ohm resistor there to uh, terminate the line. And then you need to detect uh, 
pulses that go up or pulses that go down. Now, this circuit is made to be entirely symmetrical. Um, that's actually pretty important because if you load one side more than the other, you get asymmetries and stuff like that. And so this, is, this uh, has been designed to be as symmetrical as possible to get the uh, best possible um, signal integrity and detection. Uh, I tried uh, an asymmetric one. Uh, it works more or less, but this provides better result with, uh, I think, it takes like a, a two more capacitors and two more resistors, which really doesn't matter. So the general idea is that you, again, uh, use the FPGA differential I.O. as comparators, and you pre-bias them to be off, which means, so all the P-bias here are slightly lower than negative bias. So basically, I'm biasing this at uh, uh, 0 0.33 uh, um, times the... Um, um, VCC, so like 1.1 volts. I bias this, uh, sorry, this is biased sorry, at 1.1 uh, um, volts. This is biased at 2.2 volts, which means that by default, all the comparators are off. And then when a pulse uh, arrives in one direction or the other, it will push um, both IO in one direction or the other. So if you look, you know, if you have a, a positive pulse, it will uh, turn the comparator more off for one of them and actually turn it off, uh, turn it on for the other. Um, I mean, yeah, if you if you look at the connection, it, it makes sense, but I'm not sure how to, to explain it. But basically, yeah, when you get a pulse, you, you just uh, change that bias point enough so that in, in one of the cases it turns it on and on the other, what it pass it in the wrong direction, which means it, it's already off, so it's just more off, I say, but uh, whatever. Um, oh, I mean, it's, it's off with more margin, right? okay, <laughs> right. Um, all the bias voltage, um, in this test board, they're programmable, so I use, uh, again, precedence knee modulation with just less filtering to generate them, but really, if what I found, uh, you can generate them with just a, a resistor divider and that's, that's going to be fine. That's what I'm going to do in the final hardware version. Even do adaptive yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I, I wanted to, to test to run a, like long-term uh, bit error rate measurements uh, with different bias level to see exactly uh, how much that influenced the, the bit error rate basically. Um, because if, if your bias is too great, then your pulse, of course, they don't your pulse is not uh, good enough to overcome the bias, uh, but if it's too uh, small, uh, it will actually detect pulse that aren't there. So, yeah. Uh, so that's for the uh, um, hardware interface to the FPGA. So now, what exactly is in that FPGA? Um, well, obviously, I uh, put the it's a E1 to USB, so. Uh, there's an E1 core and there's a USB core in there. Um, but coding everything in Verilog in a, like in a um, hardware description language would be inflexible and not so software defined as uh, Aral would say. Uh, and so the general architecture is that inside the FPGA I, uh, I created a custom system of ch on, on chip which has a RISC-V soft core um, that's you know executing a software like you would find on the uh, at Mel or whatever, um, and it just has a dedicated peripherals to accomplish this goal. And so those peripherals would be uh, the uh, USB core itself, um, which I presented before, and the E1 um, uh, peripheral. Uh, that does all the physical interfacing as well as all the E1 framing and deframing. And it can receive and transmit uh, E1 multi-frames. Um, so if, wait, uh, I should have put a, a diagram of an E1. Um, give me a second.
Okay, so that's an e. That's what an e, uh, an e1 frame looks like, uh, more or less. There's actually a bug, but whatever. It, it, you won't notice it. Uh, <laughs> if anybody can can point me the bug in there, <laughs> no. Um, anyway, that's what an e, uh, an e1 frame looks like. So you have uh, um, 32 time slots. Each of those squares is one bit, right? Uh, so we have 32 time slots, and then you have uh, 16 frames, and that's divided into a first uh, sub multi frame and a second sub multi frames. Um, and the sub multi frames are relevant for the CIC computation, basically. And so the, the E1 core in, the, in that system on chip will take care of uh, finding the alignment of uh, that uh, frame structure into the bit stream, and um, you just tell him, okay, the next multi-frame you receive, you write it at this particular address in memory, and it will do this. And you have a classic, you know, um, uh, FIFO of buffer descriptors, both for transmit and for receive. For transmit, instead of finding the frame alignment, well, it will actually generate it and uh, correctly generate all the fixed bits here uh, to provide the remote end with the uh, with the alignment. Um, Okay, um, so that's what the E1 core does, and it stores all the data into a giant 64K buffer. Uh, I mean, giant in relation to E1, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's actually a, a pretty long buffer. Uh, you don't have to use all of it, of course. And to uh, lower the computational load on the, on the soft core, there is actually a, a DMA core that can uh, copy data f between the E1 buffer and the uh, uh, USB transmit and receive buffers. So when you receive a multi-frame, you can just uh, issue a couple of DMA commands that copy them in the next uh, USB frame to be uh, transmitted. Um, the other peripheral that uh, you find, you can control the LED. You, you can talk to the flash, uh, which is useful to implement DFU, for instance, so that you can actually, from USB, update both the uh, FPGA bitstream and the um, uh, software image that runs on it. One interesting feature of the ice 40 that I forgot to mention is that it has a so-called warm boot. Uh, and so you can boot by default a safe image and then the fabric itself can tell the configuration logic to go and fetch a new bitstream from a different address in the uh, configuration flash. So you can have the same um, bootloader and then uh, user image that you would find in a, in a classic uh, microcontroller and have a safe update path. Um, yeah. um, you have a PDM, uh, which is, um, again, pulse density modulation, that controls the bias voltage and uh, will help for clock, clock tuning. Because one of the goals, of course, of this is to uh, provide a stable E1 clock to the base station because most of them will lock the internal OCXO to the incoming uh, bitrate of the E1. Um, so, yeah, something it's missing currently at the moment uh, is uh, a GPS DO. I didn't have any um, when I made the board. But it's um, really simple logic to add to the FPGA. And a debug guard. And then you have uh, um, the main RAM and the boot uh, RAM. Uh, that's actually necessary because the, so as I said, it has a lot of memory in a single port RAM in one megabits. The downside of this is you can't initialize it, um, which means it comes unconfigured. Once the FPGA is booted, that large array of RAM contains random data. It's not even zeroed out or anything. Uh, <laughs> which of course your soft core still needs to boot from something. Uh, thankfully, the small memory blocks, those can be initialized from the bitstream. And so what I'm doing is I'm using uh, two of those uh, uh, block RAMs as the boot ROM mapped at uh, you know, address zero. And they contain, uh, by default, a small assembly bootloader that will use the SPI peripheral to go and load the actual application program into the large memory and then jump to it. And then that small memory zone is then used as the stack space for the, uh, the C runtime. Um, yeah. 
I think that's pretty much it for the uh, other side of things. Um, I the software running on this is uh, currently very uh, basic in the sense that I've got an E1 uh, test software that implements a loopback. So you know every buffer it receives, it just feeds it to the transmit core, and I tested that uh, this actually works just fine, uh, which kind of validates the receive and transmit path. Uh, I also have a working USB stack, and by that I mean something that responds sufficiently good to the control transfer to be enumerated. Um, I tested isochronous transfers as well, uh, at least the receive uh, part. I didn't test the transmit part, but there's no reason um, that wouldn't work. But I don't have an actual firmware that implements what's actually needed to, to do that. That's something I... Uh, uh, was hoping to be done by now, but I had some issues last week uh, that needed debugging and um, and lost a bit of time uh, on there. So, but I'll be working on that next. I did some work also on uh, the host side of things because you need something to well talk to that dongle uh, and and basically bridge um, USB to. Um, um, Osmo BSP and uh, Osmo BSC, yeah, Osmo BSC and uh, uh, Osmo MGW, I think, is going to need to talk to that. And so both can't talk to the uh, to the USB device. So the general idea is to have a daemon, a daemon that we call Osmo 1D, that's going to um, allow client application to open and close time slots and stuff like that. Uh, and that's the, well, I'm gonna start with that, that's really the, that's the client uh, API for uh, for that daemon, is that you you can query different things, so you have a interface level, a line level, and a time slot uh, level, and you can query information about them, mostly, well, for uh, interface, you can mostly query uh, how many lines it has, and uh, line, I think the only, uh, thing you get as a status currently is if it's up or down. And then time slots, you have different mode, H, uh, HDLC um, or uh, raw mode. And when you open, all those communications go over a unique socket. And so when you call a TS open, it actually enables the time slot and actually starts transmitting whatever you send it. Um, you, because it's over, over uh, unique sockets, when you send the packet to open it, what you get back is an actual file descriptor, um, which you can just write your packets to. Um, and, yeah. You're doing file descriptor passing then? Yes. I, since, it, since it was possible, I figured that, oh yeah, sorry, the question was if I was doing a, a, a file descriptor passing, and, and yes. Um, the message you get back has the status, and if the if the status is okay, you actually get a file descriptor through the Unix socket, um, and that file descriptor uses a um, socksec packet. Uh, yeah, and it's created with socket pair basically. Uh, the protocol is made to be very small and easy. Uh, it's a, a few fixed uh, size uh, structure which you know map one to one to the the query and with just an uh, a provision for a version number if at some point we want to uh, to extend it or or things like that but um yeah at the moment it's i don't know, I mostly implemented the server and and client logic and how they talk to each other but there is not actually the communication to the USB side because well, the USB side isn't implemented yet. Um, so anyone that wants anyone that wants to help with that or to uh, actually use that API to go into Libos more ABIS to add support for for it uh, in there and in whatever Osmo MGW uses. Does it use also Libosmo? At the moment, it's not supported at all. So you, the support for E1 needs to be introduced at all for Osmo MGW. Also right, yeah. And uh, that's pretty much all I have. So if anybody has any questions.
So um, first of all, I think it's amazing how much effort you put into it. It's really, it's a, it's a very, very, uh, um, how can I say, I enjoy very much uh, observing it. Uh, I would love to do something with it, but uh, time is, of course, always a constraint. Yeah. Um, uh, the, so the the risk five uh, this Pico risk five existed using unmodified. So because I think at some point you yes, were thinking I about mean, your I, own micro. I did I did code my own microcontroller also for the S40. I didn't mention it because I didn't have time to draw a, <laughs> a diagram for the internals of it, and so I coded actually my own 16-bit uh, microcontroller uh, with its own instruction set and uh, compiler uh, assembler and C compiler, um, but because. I was under the assumption that um, the RISC-V would be too big, but through some configuration, I, uh, I could reduce the size of the, the PyCore V32 RISC-V and uh, also manage to clock it fast enough. I, originally, I wanted to clock all the logic at 48 megahertz, um, which is just not possible for the PyCore V32. Um, at the moment, I actually don't meet timing for this. Um, but given the huge timing margin I have that I show in the overclocking thing, it's just, it works just fine, even 20% uh, 20, 20 faster than I, I, need, I need it to. Um, I might, so here I, I draw this zone is what's clocked at 48 megahertz, which is only the USB core. Uh, I might actually imp, uh, implement um, um, a cross clock uh, so it is th this block uh, crosses clock domain uh, for the, uh, the wishbone internal bus between uh, 30.72 and 48. Uh, I might actually run uh, the SOC itself at 24 megahertz uh, to meet timing in the future if, uh, if need be, but uh, at the moment it works just fine and I'm kind of hoping the uh, open source tools will evolve enough to meet timing. Is that and how much capacity do you use in the FPGA? At the uh, so at the moment, I'm using around 70% of the logic inside the FPGA, uh, the majority of which is actually taken by the PyCore V32. Uh, the PyCore V32 basically takes about 1,500 um, logic elements, and I'm at 3,000. So it's like a, a half the design is, uh, is that. Um, uh, ideally, in the final board, I'd like to put two E1 interfaces uh, because I have the IOs for it, and I think it would uh, enab enable some uh, interesting use uh, to have two interfaces, like uh, an uh, active sniffer or actively uh, be able to inject the data into one time slot and not the other, or that, that kind of stuff that you can do uh, if you have two interfaces, basically. Yeah. Okay, thank you.